Good evening. My name is Brian Yang, and I'm a Los Angeles County Superior Court judge and a board member for the Merkley Law Alumni Los Angeles chapter. It's my honor tonight uh, to welcome you uh, to this event showcasing two illustrious Merkley Law alumni who are leading in the California legislature, Senators Ben Allen and Henry Stern. Both senators represent districts that encompass Los Angeles County, and we alumni here in LA could not be prouder. Senators Allen and Stern will share their paths to elected office, their legislative priorities for the state, and their advice for those in attendance who may want to follow in their footsteps. I note that we extended an invitation to Re Republican Assembly member Jordan Cunningham from the class of 2004, but he had a scheduling conflict. I want to thank Mary Matherson, Aaron Deneen, Deneen, sorry, and others from the Development and Alumni Office and the Senator's fantastic staff for helping to organize this great event. Without further ado, I would like to introduce an incredible alumna of Berkeley Law, our moderator for tonight, Anne O'Leary. How fortunate of us to have her moderate. Ms. O'Leary is a partner in the litigation department of Jenner and Block and a co-chair of the firm's government controversies and public policy litigation practice. Prior to joining the firm, she served as Chief of Staff for California Governor Gavin Newsom. She led the governor's office during unprecedented times. I wish we could all get back to presidented times, but uh, that's besides the point. Um, she managed the office during the worst wildfires in the state's history, and of course, during the global COVID-19 pandemic. Earlier in her career, Ms. O'Leary served as senior policy advisor to Senator Hillary Clinton's 2016 presidential campaign and co-executive director of the clinton kane Transition Project. She was also a deputy city attorney in San Francisco, executive director of UC Berkeley Law's Center on Health, Economic and Family Security, and a policy advisor with the White House Domestic Policy Council. She graduated from our alma mater in 2005. The floor is yours, Anne. Thank you so much, Judge Yang. I have to uh, take a point of personal privilege to say what an honor it is to have you uh, be serving in the state of California on the bench. Uh, one of my proudest uh, pieces of work that Governor Newsom asked me to do is to work really closely with our judicial secretary on something that was really important to the governor and to all of us, which is to ensure that the bench in California looks more like California. You are a leader uh, in the Asian American community, and it's really wonderful to know that you're on the bench, and I really appreciate your introduction. So thank you so much for, um, for organizing this and for what you're doing for public service for our state. It's really meaningful. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, and I'm really delighted to be here with our two senators, um, but also friends of mine uh, who I had the great privilege of serving with when I was up in Sacramento for the last few years as the governor's chief of staff. I think um, it's, I'm always proud to be a Berkeley Law alum, but I'm particularly proud when I know that I have people like Senator Stern and Senator Allen as alums and colleagues um, in the battle. And I wanna say, they do the work that they do um, at great personal sacrifice. I think we, we all experience it, but Senator Allen has a young family and Senator Stern um, has a, a, a wife and a baby on the way. And uh, there's a lot of sacrifices that come with um, commuting back and forth to Sacramento. Um, it's not surprising. Both of them are extraordinary public servants. And I think that I, I'll just say a few words about each of them and then I wanna open it up, but I, um, if you ask me to say kind of one thing that I know about them without reading their bios, um, I would say that they're both two of the biggest champions for our climate and our environment in the state of California's legislature. 
And uh, Senator Stern is somebody who I had the great privilege of working with on wildfire issues. I did notice from his bio that he's now been asked to chair the legislative, uh, the joint legislative committees um, on emergency management. That may sound like a mouthful, but I want to say how critically important it is, which is that there are far too many urgent emergencies in California uh, from COVID to climate to uh, often the racial injustices that are going on. And having a legislative joint committee work extraordinarily closely with the executive branch is very fundamental and important. So I really want to thank Senator Stern for stepping up to that. But I had the really good privilege of working with Senator Stern, both on his broad work on climate change. He's really somebody who's a very deep thinker on these issues, always thinking about how do we not only ensure that we're making goals in California for climate, but we're implementing on them, that we understand what's happening, that we are looking at the assessment of how we're doing. Uh, he's put, put forth legislation that's passed and been signed for the governor on those issues. Uh, but he's also somebody who unfortunately lives in a district that has been impacted uh, himself personally by wildfires and his constituents. And so I often think of uh, being on the phone with him where he's urgently trying to ensure that his constituents are getting everything that's possibly needed uh, for the, the wildfires. And so I thank you, Senator Stern, uh, for all you do for our state. Uh, Senator Allen um, is doing just tremendous work and I want to applaud him. Uh, he's been, I've been on the phone with him late at night in legislative sessions, particularly around the issue of recycling. Uh, this is an issue that is um, so important, and I think one of the things that impresses me about Senator Allen is that it's a, it's a hard issue that he's not giving up on, which is to say that we have a problem that probably has been exacerbated by COVID-19, as we all are have been sitting in our homes ordering Amazon packages, um, but Senator Allen has been really looking at the global recycling issue and trying to see what we can do in California to not only make it better for Californians, but also to have an impact impact on the uh, recycling issue around the globe. So I am so grateful that he continues on in that battle and that leadership. He's also somebody who um, is a, a member and a leader, in, um, in fact, the chair of the Legislative Jewish Caucus. And I have seen him time and again stand up against anti-Semitism, uh, really forcefully speaking out on behalf of his constituents. And so I think of him in those, those ways as well. So we are so lucky to have both of them as Berkeley Law alums, but also just to have their leadership in the state Senate. So thank you both for being here today. Um, let me start with something kind of less weighty uh, to get us going. I, I've never asked you this, but I wanted to know, you both are class of 08 and 09, and I'm curious about whether or not you knew each other in law school and you had cooked this idea up that you're gonna both be serving in the state Senate when you were in law school together. I'll let one of you tell the story, whoever wants to go first. Is it Ben? Did we cook it up? I don't know if we cooked it. <laughs> um we we had it on a simmer maybe i mean so so and the great funny the funny thing is i also bryant i i got i knew bryant uh, pretty well in law school as well he was class of 07 um yeah no henry and i uh became really fast friends at berkeley we had a lot of uh a, a lot of kind of similar background henry's a little younger than me but um we actually grew up in the same school district wow. uh, santa monica malibu um and we knew a lot of the same same folks uh, we both went to the same undergraduate institution. We didn't know each other there. Um, but then we both ended up at, 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 at Bolt Berkeley Law together and, um, and really uh, just hit it off. Um, I was lucky enough to become the, the student member of the Board of Regents for, for the UC. And Henry became my right-hand man on lots and lots of things, especially all things environmental. And we ended up doing a pretty cool project together. We got a resolution passed at the, at the, at the Regents table that upped the green building standards for the entire university system. And as a result, you know, the UC has more uh, LEED certified buildings than any university system in the country uh, as a result of our work. And, and, um, and yeah, we just, so, uh, you know, then Henry kind of went off to DC and was working for Fran Pavley and I was running. And, and um, the funny thing is, um, his mom, I think, hosted one of my first events when I was up in Malibu when I was running for the Malibu, Santa Monica Malibu School Board. Um, and then, um, and then actually, when uh, uh, he was a staffer, I was, uh, uh, you know, I, I was running for office, and I would come crash on his on his futon. It was not very comfortable uh, when I come up to Sacramento, and then and then I got elected, and then I was helping him. So it, yeah, no, we've it's it's a really cool story, and it's very much rooted in in Berkeley Law. That's wonderful. And, and I will say, I think the first time we really 
hung out was we were, it was political activism. I think so, because he was also running, I think the, or no one really ran it, but the Berkeley Democrats. And we were, we were in a fight over, you know, the future of Congress. And we went out to, you know, a suburb of the Bay Area, knocking on doors and, and uh, such a self- Stockton. We went to Stockton. Yeah, we were trying to, yeah. I think it was uh, Richard Pombo was in our sights at the time. Yeah. Um, the resources chair of the house at the moment. And uh, we ended up flip the house flipped and I went off and worked for Henry Waxman. And, uh, but I just hanging out and becoming friends in that way with somebody like Ben and the self-effacing style, total diligence, you know, just like a lot of deep thinking and late nights and talking the friendship part of it before it was like, we weren't really political operators per se there. I mean, I don't think, I don't even think Ben really knew, I don't know, that you knew you were going to go run for state senate back then. It wasn't my plan. I was wanting to be a lawyer. You know, I wanted to be a really deep dive climate change attorney. That was, I was obsessed with that and renewable energy. And, but out of our passion, the work kind of evolved. But now, yeah, it's, it's when you. That's when, lovely. I, I mean, I think. Weird, it, can I just say one thing? In a yeah. weird way, Henry, I think that the fact that the two of us started to circle this at the same time encourage the other to do it, right? I mean, the fact that you were staffing right. and, and, and working right. with Fran, like it just, it gave me a proximity to the Senate in a way that I might not have. And then similarly, you know, I think you saw me get elected. You're like, well, I could do this too. So right. I, I, in a weird way, we, I think we ended up complimenting, you know, you, you kind of think building each other's thought that this was actually possible to do. Well, I, I love this. I love, I love several things about it, but you know, one is, that I think it takes peer mentorship, peer encouragement, friendship uh, to do this. It's uh, politics is not for the weak of heart. <laughs> and so I think, or weak of mind. Uh, and so I think having uh, people who are in your corner uh, intellectually, but also uh, it, it, as friends is such a big deal. So I love that. But I also love the fact that the first thing you did together was an environmental initiative uh, as students. Uh, can you tell us a little bit, I, I said a little bit in the intro about the amazing work you do, uh, but I don't actually know myself, have you authored legislation together or do you uh, co-op, you know, I imagine you co-sponsor each other's bills, but you know, it sounds like this is a decades long conversation about what to do about the environment, how to change it, how to support it. How does that play out in terms of being colleagues now, state senators together in terms of the climate and environment agenda that you work on um, in, in Sacramento? I mean, we're, we're both the, the chairs of the two lead environmental committees in the Senate. So I chair the Senate Natural Resources and Water Committee, and that oversees everything from like oil drilling, ocean protection, um, you know, wildlife issues and wildfire issues. And then Ben chairs environmental quality, which is about, you know, toxic pollution and greenhouse gas emissions and clean water and toxics and all kinds of issues. So we're, we're, we're not just sort of corroborators or, you know, sort of co-conspirators on behalf of the, the planet, yeah. but we're, uh, you have you know, formal, formal yeah, we're formally in yeah. there. So, so we, you know, we're, we're really building, um, we're, you know, we sort of have as our role of building leadership capacity within the legislature. The environment is not always the most well-heeled lobby. It's not a particularly powerful lobby always at, morally maybe powerful from a media perspective, but um, when you're going get up against, you know, the oil industry or the plastics industry, you know, it, it, you need folks, um, you know, in there blocking and tackling. So we have to look out for each other all the time and a lot of co-authorship and sort of bring in other people to the table. So it's, uh, it's very crucial. Yeah, that, that, I think that's so interesting. Ben, can you say a little bit just about, um, you know, being lawyers in the state Senate? So one of the things that I think is striking, um, you know, when, you know, and I, I'm a little bit older than both of you, but when I was growing up, so many members of Congress or state legislatures were attorneys. It was kind of, uh, you almost had to be, maybe not had to be, but there was a lot. And it was striking to me when I got to Sacramento that, um, you know, there's a handful, uh, some, mostly from San Francisco or LA, uh, but not that many attorneys, well, some some on the other side uh, who are uh, also from a different districts, but, but still not very many lawyers. Mm -hmm. How does it play out? Does it help you? Do you feel like um, having the law degree, you know, gives you a, a kind of superpower? Tell us a little bit about it. 
Yeah, no. It, it, well, so first of all, um, you're absolutely right. Uh, there's been a there's there, there there are far fewer lawyers in the legislature than there used to. I think it's, it is it's the toll that's been taken by by uh, by um, term limits. Uh, you know, I think a lot of lawyers, you know, kind of decided that this wasn't a, this wasn't a great career path for them. Uh, but I got to tell you, it is immensely useful to be a lawyer. It gives you uh, insight into both how the law ought to be crafted, how it will be interpreted. Uh, it also allows you to, I think, um, call BS sometimes on some of the legal advice and legal opinions and legal advocacy that has floated in all sorts of different directions uh, by people who are trying to muddy the waters. And I think, quite frankly, a lot of our colleagues who are not lawyers um, oftentimes get bamboozled by lawyers. Now, you know, that being said, there's, 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 I think it's important for there to be lots of different voices in the legislature, right? You want people who've got experience in business or the nonprofit sector uh, or in the public sector, uh, et cetera. Uh, so there's, there's value to having lots of different career paths to the legislature, but it's really important to have folks who've got, uh, who've got good legal training. And I got to tell you, I mean, Henry in particular, both has, having been a former staffer and an attorney and now serving, he really gets into the weeds on, on, on so many bills. And it really is important. And I think, unfortunately, a, a, lot of the, a lot of the staff and the bureaucracy and also the advocates almost rely on the idea that the legislators aren't getting too much into the details. We've got so many bills to vote on. It's extraordinary how many decisions we have to make uh, in the course of a year, uh, just judgment calls on bill after bill after bill, usually uh, bills involving very complex issues on a lot of different topics. And uh, it's important to have folks like Henry, and, and, and I think it tends to be the lawyers who do this, who really stay, wait a minute, let, you know, let's get into the details here. Oh, the bill does this. Okay, well, can you show me where it does that in the bill? Oh, well, here. Well, that's not exactly what it says. You know, and a lot of, a lot of the other members don't always feel the same confidence to do that. Um, yeah. So, yeah, Senator Allen, something you said reminds me of, uh, you know, a little bit of your bio, which is, uh, you know, I was so struck, you know, people talk about the supermajority in the, in the California state legislature with regard to Democrats, but, you know, the fact of the matter is that there are term limits that, as you said, that there are, um, a lot of Sacramento is run by uh, staffers and by lobbyists, and, um, you know, I, I think that the, the special interests play, do continue to play a big role where it makes it harder to, Get progressive legislation through the through the uh, through the Senate through the Assembly. Can you just speak to a little bit of? Um, I know you've been trying for for a long time to make sure that there's transparency and giving. You know, do you see that changing? Is there a way in which um, you know? Is it term limits? Is it transparency? Is it something else? And I mean, Henry, I'd like your opinion too. Just how do we make sure that we keep, especially on issues like the environment, where you know, frankly, the the fossil fuel lobby for a long time has made it challenging. Uh, they've partnered with labor unions to make it challenging. So what do you think we can do about some of these issues that uh, are out there in terms of, you know, of course, having smart lawyers helps, but it's, and sometimes it's not enough. And sometimes you can outlawyer yourself a little bit, right? Like, I mean, there's a risk to, like, I was very careful and Ben too, I think, coming in not to try to act like the smartest guy in the room, right? No one wants to know it all. No one wants the person who's like, well, on three A's, you know, little I, it says this. And to try to be, make that useful to people, not like, not, not a prideful thing, but a useful thing, you know, um, but the, yeah, you, what you're talking about is a political problem, which has very little to do with all this incredible training we got at, at Berkeley Law, and, uh, you know, in some yeah, ways, it's, it's like, the, you know, being a smart lawyer is not enough. It, it's, well, it's uh, almost, it's, and it can be a hindrance, because you're, you're like, but this doesn't like, why are we voting on it yet? It's not ready. Or like, I mean, it, it almost, sometimes I wish I knew less, you know, it'd be easier to, to, to angst over things so much, but you know, I studied too hard in Phil Fricky's legislation class. May he rest in peace. One of the great ledge interpretation great. You know, law, uh, law scholars ever. Um, and, you know, or I think of Ann O'Connell who was taught me admin law and about Chevron deference. And I'm thinking, how ambiguous are we gonna make this line? Like, you know, like, I just think about delegated authority and who's then gonna challenge that. And I, you know, I'm going through too much in my head sometimes on these votes in it. And it's, it's interesting to see in some ways that the, the, the politicians who don't worry about the weeds and are just like, you know, stay in high level about it. Um, you know, sometimes that ignorance is, is, is useful in, in a sense, because you're really trying to, it's a very people-driven enterprise, and it's about, you know, who needs to be heard, and, 
and it's a little sim not simpler because it's a sophisticated art in it's in that way but um yeah i don't know i i have to tamp it down sometimes to be quite honest well, and I'll tell you, you know, in law school, sometimes you, you talk about the majesty of the law and what's the intent of the legislature? What was what was the, the purpose <laughs> behind this? And I'll got to tell you, serving in the legislature, it is depressing sometimes uh, how, how unmajestic the process can be. <laughs> and um, you think about how, how, how you know, our best minds are going into filing briefs, uh, trying to interpret what the legislature was doing and um, uh, and coming up with really good explanations. <laughs> Uh, and yet sometimes the decisions that are made are made for reasons that you, are, are quite frankly embarrassing and a little, and sometimes even appalling. Um, you know, I think there's, I mean, our campaign finance system is borders on legalized corruption from my perspective. Um, I think that uh, personality politics ends up playing a much bigger role than you'd think. You know, people are mad at each other for having not supported them on something else. And then all of a sudden they're blocking that other guy's bill for reasons that have nothing to do with the substance of the bill. Um, so it, 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 there, there have been some aspects of this that have been pretty dispiriting. Yeah, but I, but I will I will say you know we're giving you the very 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 unvarnished look at yeah. Sacramento, but I will say that this is we have an embarrassment of riches though in that it's a lot of folks trying to make progress together and it's almost that we're stumbling over ourselves to tr to try to do it whereas. I don't know if we were looking at sort of existential crises on a daily basis in terms of working in the house, you know, is a whole other animal. So I don't know who, uh, you know, at least as frustrating as it may be, I, I do think, um, I don't know, Ben and I are hard on ourselves and he has got, he has pushed through some serious campaign finance and political ethics reform legislation. He chaired elections committee before I did. I then took the committee after him. Um, you know, everything from like, you wouldn't have voting centers in California if it weren't for Ben Allen, right? Like people wouldn't be able to go out and not just vote on that election day, but in those weeks leading up to it, if Ben hadn't done all his homework and got it through. So like, yeah, there's all this democratizing work that's happening where we just, you know, we have very high expectations of California. And, and, I, and I know you do too, Anne. And, 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 and it's like, just trying to pull on those better angels of our nature constantly in whatever scrum you're in, whether you're in the you know executive office in the governor's office or in an agency or in the legislature, it's um, those sort of the ethical ones within there have a really sacred and frustrating role to play. Yeah, no, I think that's right. Let me ask you, you know, just to kind of tie some of this together, it's been extraordinary. I mean, I don't think any of us uh, thought, well, you know, of course, you sign up for public service. None of us signed up for a global pandemic and, you know, raging wildfires due to climate change and everything else that's happened in California. And there's been really, you know, um, I will say interesting, some might say partisan, I will say interesting, uh, because some mm -hmm. of it may not be partisan um, debates. Um, in fact, with some of the other people who were in the state legislature who are lawyers, uh, so Assembly Members Kylie and Gallagher have been super suing uh, the governor uh, over questions about executive authority versus legislative authority. And I think, you know, um, you know, putting aside, you know, the, the potential partisan nature of it, I think it's an interesting question. You know, Henry, you're serving right now as a co-chair of this emergency management. When we started the, you know, COVID-19 crisis, it was a very challenging time because the legislature wasn't sure that they could meet in person for public health reasons. And there were not good rules, constitutional restrictions with regard to voting, um, which made it that the governor, you know, with me and others in his office helping him doing executive order after executive order on major issues that were impacting the state of California. It would be helpful. I, I would just love to hear your kind of maybe nonpartisan, um, unvarnished uh, opinions about how you think about the role of the legislature versus the role of the governor in addressing the state's emergencies. I'll go, I'll start and then I'll put my, maybe I'll put my foot in my mouth, Ben can pull it out. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, when you're in the legislature, there's a there's a closeness with people, and there's a sort of pride in the the, the you know the bill and the sort of deliberative process, right? That that in theory you're seeing everything right above board. There's a committee hearing, and you talk about what the amendment's going to be, or a budget item gets debated, and it's ostensibly a very transparent process um, that's the closest connected to the people. But when it comes to management during emergencies and 
the ability to kind of uh, execute efficiently, but also avoid some of the, the political pull that will get through the legislative process where you end up, you find some kind of equilibrium, but it ends up a lot of time being sort of just counterparty negotiation. And you're just trying to settle an issue as opposed to like, what's the right thing to do right now? And, you know, I found myself with our, with our fellow alumni, uh, Mr. Gallagher, feeling very differently about how the California constitution operates and frankly, what's in the best interest of the people. Because I think if the governor hadn't been acting nimbly and for instance, like getting ballots out to people to make sure they could participate in an election or enacting public health orders and not having to wait for the legislature, but going very fast to save people's lives and keep hospitals open or, or deploying forces all over the state to fight like 200 wildfires at a time, you know, we, we, there's a little bit of, uh, what do I call it? Maybe FOMO is, is the, 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 you know, the cousin of FOMO of like, the governor's doing everything, what we want to do it too. I think, you know, some of the bigger contracts, all that kind of stuff, we want our hands on it. Um, but I think in our oversight role and that sort of natural tension is very, is healthy. But I think that there's a, you know, there's an ability to act quickly that, that challenges some of our democratic sort of underpinnings. And I think, you know, in, in this kind of pluralistic of a process, can you go fast enough to deal with the fast moving pandemic, right? Like are other countries that don't have the same kind of process that we do able to, you know, lock it down faster? And, and is there a sort of, and the cultural backlash to it, right? Like Mr. Gallagher and others are demanding freedom, right? And they want as much freedom as possible and, and that they're being restricted. They're wearing, you have to wear their masks and they don't want to get their, their vaccine. And how dare the governor, you know, push that, those orders upon them, that it's somehow, you know, seen as almost like, you know, um, uh, you know, some, a different kind, not, not democracy, but, it, it, you know, you're some unitary form of government. But, uh, you know, there's no freedom without actual, like, order like basic health and safety and i actually my freedom was restricted this past year and i my family got hurt because a lot of other people wanted to you know exercise the, their i guess what they consider their rights to do so so i don't know it's a it's a it's a fascinating experiment and i i personally tend towards um really really transparent but but unmitigated executive uh um, order at when an emergency happens. And I don't think we can do it any other way. I don't know, like looking back in retrospect, could, could it have somehow run some of this stuff through the legislature? I don't think we had time. I think if we had waited, people would have gotten hurt. But I don't know. I, maybe there's a more philosophical point there in there somewhere, but. Uh, no, I think it's really, it's helpful in terms of just the, um, you know, constitutional division and then the real time uh, restrictions of what you're dealing with an emergency. Uh, it's it's fascinating. Uh, Senator Allen, any any thoughts from you on that? I put my foot in my mouth. Yeah. Do you want to want to? No. Help? I mean, in, in the end of the day, it, the the legislature. It's not as though the governor just seized power and told us all what to do. The legislature looked at this at the issues that Henry just described, said, okay, what do we think the best course of action is under this set of circumstances, and decided we are going to empower the governor beyond how he is usually empowered. We're going to maintain oversight. We're going to have regular meetings. We're going to ask lots of questions. We reserve the right to end this uh, situation, um, you know, in the future. Uh, we're, we're, you know, if we don't feel comfortable with this arrangement as we go along, we can always get back together and, and, re, uh, and, and change the arrangement. But it was ultimately the legislature's decision to do this because of the exigencies of, of the situation. And, uh, and I think a recognition of exactly what Henry described, which is that this moment called for uh, uh, you know, for, 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 for giving the governor the power to do what he needed to do to get this pandemic under control. So it's not as though it was some decision by the governor. It was the legislature's decision. And the legislature retains the right to modify the arrangement um, as it sees fit, as, as, this, as the situation continues to evolve. Yeah, that's really helpful. Let me um, bring it back to kind of tie some of these things together. So, you know, we started the conversation, I was thinking 
uh, Judge Yang for, for sitting on the bench and for all that he does. Um, you know, as we think about everything that's happening in California, we have an extraordinarily diverse state. Um, and one of the things that we did in the, in the governor's office that I was so proud of was to really talk about California for all and just ensuring that everything we did was about making sure that there was representation, that people saw themselves, that they knew that there was, you know, language access, that there was um, people uh, helping every community. And we saw that, you know, the human is hardest hit by every one of of these problems, whether it's fires or air quality or uh, environmental justice issues, or it was COVID, uh, that it you know disproportionately impacts um, Black and Brown communities. Um, and yet, you know, one of the things we also talked about is you guys were able to support each other. You're both getting to the legislature, but there's too few, um, you know, there's more people who look like you in the legislature than look like the rest of California. So we still have, you know, 55% of the legislature is white compared to 40% of California. What would you say to your fellow alums just about how do we work to make sure that, you know, not only do we have great leaders like you, but we have great leaders who are also, um, you know, diverse. And, and I know, you know, of course, both of you have done such a good job representing, you know, all of your constituents. And I want to say that I saw that, I heard that in all the questions you asked. But I, I'd love to hear that just what your thoughts are in terms of just encouraging diversity and ensuring that we, as we deal with the hardest problems, uh, that people really see full representation in our state. It, you, you, and you correctly point out a, a, a problem, a challenge. Um, I will say we have ever-growing and increasingly powerful women's caucus, Latino caucus, API caucus, Black caucus um, that have become really powerful and important blocks in the legislature. I mean, if uh, you know, not, basically nothing gets through the legislature if the Latino caucus. Uh, doesn't doesn't support it. Same thing with the women's caucus. Um, so you know, but but there's but there's there's no question we have a lot more progress to make with regards to diversifying the legislature. Um, I guess what I would say is, um, first of all, you know, people. So first of all, be on the lookout for for smart, talented people from diverse backgrounds. Encourage them to run for office. Encourage them to get involved at the local level. And, you know, start with commissions or city council or like school boards, etc. Local committees. Um, we need more more training programs. Uh, there's some wonderful programs for women, especially uh, you know, like Emerge, for example, is a, is a good a good organization. Um, you know, Emily's List, and there's there's a number of of, of kind of spin-off organizations that really focus on training the next generation of young female leaders and and just getting them in the mindset of running for office. Running for office is a weird experience. Uh, it's it's not like a lot of normal things, and and you've got to you've got to just be able to ask people for help and you've got to be able to draw upon your contacts for fundraising and for support and for door knocking and all those kinds of things. And, um, you know, a lot of people who come from disadvantaged backgrounds don't feel the confidence to, uh, to, 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 to pull that sort of operation together and make those kinds of asks of people. And yet there are more and more uh, people from, from very diverse, very disadvantaged backgrounds who are getting elected to office. And there's some inspiring stories. Of, of, you know, I mean, look at, look at our superintendent of public instruction, who was literally a foster, uh, a, 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 a kid in the foster uh, a system um, when he was younger. Now he's a statewide elected official. And so there's more and more of those stories. I guess I would just say, if you're interested in running for office, do it, you know, get yourself, you know, prepare yourself, learn about it, learn what, you know, and I'm sure Henry and I would be happy to talk to you about the process. Um, and then if you have, you know, if you have friends who are looking, who are really good, support them, get behind them, um, donate money to them. Uh, encourage them. Um, this, it's not, you know, it's, what's funny about this is I think some people look at the government as this far off thing that they can't really influence or get involved with. That, you know, we, we were just with school with, you know, with, with Bryant, right? We were all kind of hanging out and like, you know, going to torts class and, and you know, and, and being silly. And now, um, you know, we're, we're all in positions of, of, of a certain amount of authority. And it's because, you know, we, we stepped up and, 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 and just threw ourselves in there. And um, I, I know I know that we came to this work with with a certain degree of privilege. There's no question about it. Uh, I will say part of what we also need to do, part of why I'm passionate about campaign finance reform, uh, is because I do think that the current system ends up being uh, re really skewing toward replicating the status quo. And one thing I, I certainly I'm, I've been passionate about trying to create uh, new, new, new avenues for, for public financing and, and, and new ways uh, to, to open up the system structurally 
so that we can get more diversity into elective office as well. And I think that's, that's another part of this, of this effort. Yeah, that's helpful. Henry? Um, you know, the, the success stories are exciting. I, I would just point you to some real people, specific people. So Alex Lee, who just was elected to the assembly at the age of 23, um, uh, first uh, uh, LGBT API post-millennial. He was a, an intern in my office and did administrative work initially, but he was so smart and understood policy so well. We just did a lot of mentoring and we'd stay up late at night and talk about the bills on the floor. And he had the guts to go home, knock on 40,000 doors and go beat an entire field of incumbents and is now like one of the leaders on housing policy and uh, electoral reform and a very brave, brave person already in the legislature just got shot out of cannon at age 23 out of San Jose. And he grew up, he grew up impoverished too, by the way. Yeah, tough working family. And I mean, look at Isaac Bryan, same, I mean, out of the foster system in Los Angeles, um, you know, run-ins with carceral, carceral injustice and, you know, from South LA, but, you know, got through the UC system and now another super young person right there in the legislature after he designed a big criminal justice reform effort in LA called Measure J, he launched that into into a seat in the legislature. And I get to, you know, now I'm like flying up with him and it's, I, you know, it's, it, it's happening. It's, it's, it, it just, um, it needs the, the nitty gritty mentorship. I think there's systemic work that has to happen, but it, it also is about um, just looking, not overlooking talent that's sitting right in front of your eyes of people that you're friends with and that you know. And so, you know, to, I, I, hear, I see Samantha in the chat uh, in Berkeley 19, talking about interest in the future, and then a former former uh, Democratic nominee, John Burke, out there. But uh, I don't know if he's going to dust off the the resume. But um, but yeah, it's sometimes it's right in front of you, and you see leadership where you don't even realize it. So you got to be intentional. Yeah, no, I really appreciate both of you saying that, and I think you know we all, we all have a part to continue to ensure that. So I appreciate both of your leadership. That's great. Um, let me ask you, uh, and we're going to open it up to Q&As in about five minutes or so, uh, but I want to make sure to get two more questions in. Um, so, so one is, you know, you both are, have, are doing extraordinary work. I mean, it really is a, a pleasure to see both of you leading. What is, I want to know what success looks like to you, which is, you know, when you finish your term in the Senate, what do you want to have achieved? What do you want to be remembered for? Well, I, I mean, I, you, you bring up, um, well, okay, I, I, I think, as you, as you mentioned, both of us are passionate about environmental policy. Um, you know, I will say, I, I feel like the environment is one area where the, where, where, the, where the system is just not structured to act um, aggressively enough. There's just, there's not, a, there's not a, a, an organized and politically powerful block to advocate for more bold environmental progress. And yet, as you mentioned, we've got a Democratic supermajority in the legislature in, in California. We're the fifth largest economy in the world. There's so much low hanging fruit in terms of environmental progress. Henry's been a big leader on climate issues. And, and man, I just having read that IPCC report, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm all the more passionate about making sure that California continues to take a leadership role. You mentioned the fact that I've been working on, on, on plastics and recycling and waste management. That's an area where I, I continue to believe that we have, we, 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 we're, we're so close. We've come so close to passing a comprehensive legislation that would, I think, have real global impact uh, by, by, by basically phasing out non-recyclable, non-reusable, um, non-compostable single-use plastics, or at least most of them. Uh, you know, there, there are certain parameters we put in place to protect for food safety and pharmaceuticals and those kinds of things. Um, and, and, you know, the, the truth of the matter is on so many of these environmental questions, they're really, they're, there's, there's not a, um, what we're asking for really doesn't involve that dramatic a change in people's lifestyles. It just involves using a better, more sustainable product, right? So most people don't, couldn't care less if they drove a gas powered vehicle or an electric vehicle but they just want to make sure they can get from point A to point B. You know, when you go to the store and you buy a TV, you don't care if your TV is wrapped 
in styrofoam that's going to break up into tiny little pieces and end up in the ocean and become very damaging uh, or or a, a sustainable fully biodegradable foam from your perspective you just want to make sure your tv shows up intact and not cracked by the time it gets to your house but making these decisions and this is where really ultimately where government has to step in because in the end of the day the private sector is not going to do this right the private sector is just going to do whatever uh, it, it can do um, at, at the lowest cost that, that's allowed under the under the current rules and they ultimately have so little skin in the game with regards to the ultimate end use of their products and so uh, so so it's about shifting toward more sustainable products and that's that's ultimately what I'm trying to do with SB 54 you know which is this big plastics bill that I'm just really hopeful we'll be able to get done either in, in the form of the bill or through a statewide ballot measure that's now qualified for the next ballot. So I, I think th that, that would certainly be what, what I'm, I'm really hoping to get done. I certainly want to partner, you know, I'm continuing to partner with Henry and a couple other members on some major climate issues. And then, you know, you know I've, I've been working on some criminal justice reform issues that I'm, I'm passionate about, and then transparency and, um, and, and just trying to create more, trying to think more about the structures that, 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 that lead to an unfairness and that lead to, um, uh, uh, you know, special interest domination and just try to bend those structures a little bit more toward the public interest. And I've got a number of bills I've worked on that I'm going to continue to work on that, that will help to do that. And um, so th that, that's that's what I'm hoping will will be a longer term legacy. That's what I'm not even ready to reflect, Dan. I'm like, I, I feel like I still just started. I don't want to look back. Like I was, we were talking, Ben and I were talking to the former governor, Jerry Brown, the other day, and he was admonishing us. He's like, you know, he's like, don't die. Uh, I'll do my best. This is not a very good impression, but like, don't worry about bills. You just got to build, build buildings. Like, don't worry about bills, build things. Um, there's a, we get enamored with legislation sometimes, but how to actually, like, what does progress really look like? And the path to it is often bills um, or a smart agency decision. But, you know, black women in LA have four times higher infant mortality rates than white women in LA. And, and a lot of it has to do with, you know, not just the healthcare system, but the what they're breathing into their lungs um, as moms or expectant mothers. And uh, Latino men have the highest rising cancer rates um, of any class in the whole state. Um, so the disparity between what it's like to be 50 year old working white man in LA versus a working Latino man, it's, uh, it's huge, and and those sort of those systemic um, gaps in our system. We're sort of we're starting with legislation, but we're trying to end up at a very human, very human result, which is just people able to, to live their lives with a little more health and a little more dignity. And you know, for undocumented Angelinos, not to have to look over their shoulder all the time and live in fear, or not be able to have access to the same health care, and even though they're contributing to the economy. And so those are the, I mean. Those are the big ticket. Uh, that's the you know that's the the meridian line there, if you will, of looking out off into the distance. But uh, I don't know, kind of in the weeds of it all right now. So it's like I I'm 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 appalled at, at all these these broken promises, even in a great state like California. Um, but it's gonna it's kind of gonna happen on our watch, or it's not right. Like between now and 2030. We're either going to achieve the uh, the vision that you laid out with Governor Newsom to have this fleet get electrified and for people to stop spending uh, all their money on gasoline and fixing up their cars and start start spending more on like feeding their kids and their health care. Um, that's all going to kind of shake out over this decade. So yeah. I don't even know if we'll have the luxury of a legacy. You know, it's like if the legacy is how does it look right away and. Uh, it's it's that history doesn't need to wait too long to judge us well you know i i just want to say thank you to both of you it's um it, it's so critical and i think you know one of the things that um you know what as you're as you're coming up you know ben was joking around about like you know we were just kids in the tour class uh you know looking at each other and then suddenly you're in these positions of power and I think that if I've learned anything, it's that when you're looking for the adult in the room, uh, you should look in the mirror because you're probably it. And so the fact of the matter is that you guys, um, you know, and I'm, I'm tearing up because I'm super proud of both of you. Um, it is extraordinary to have your leadership at this very scary time for our climate and for our kids. And so thank you for your for what you do every day. Um, I'm gonna- Thank you. We don't even get to thank you. We didn't get to interview you. Like 
time. I don't know if the audience understands who, like how, how hard of a job you just had and how, I mean, I, I don't, I, we didn't even get to like, we did the unvarnished. I know, I know that wasn't the, uh, the That's agenda right. for our, our, our Zoom here. But, well, I'm, I'm very happy and I know we've got a, a terrific uh, LA audience here. So I want to turn it over. Uh, I'm really happy that we also have um, Yuri, who is there. He Is he um, up on the screen yet? There he is, Yuri Kapkin, who is a partner at Quinn Emanuel and who is um, a great Berkeley alum. He's the president of the Berkeley um, Law Los Angeles chapter. He's on the board of directors of the Berkeley Law Alumni Association. So he's always giving back to our great law school. And so he is going to moderate the Q&A. So thank you. I'm going to go off screen. It was lovely to be part of this and I'll listen to the Q&A. Thank, thank you. you. Miss you. Great. Thanks so much, Anne. And thank you, Senator Allen. Thank you, Senator Stern. Um, Let's go ahead and go to the Q&A then. Um, the first question comes from Judge Kelvin Filer of the Los Angeles Superior Court. His question is, as a result of this crazy current election, are there any thoughts for changing the laws regarding the process for recalling the governor? Who came up with this current two-step process? Yeah, uh, so, so I'm... Um, this is an old model that goes back to the progressive era, at least my best understanding, um, that had to do with, you know, the people being able to rise up and toss somebody out who had engaged in malfeasance or some grotesque violation of their um, campaign promises. Um, you know, from my perspective, you know, some of the, the, the more recent recalls have really been abuses of the process. Um, and in fact, I've got, I've got a, a constitutional amendment proposal. This is all in the constitution, so it's hard to change, but I've actually got a constitutional amendment proposal that would uh, change the model. Um, there, from my perspective, I think we should be thinking about changing it in one of two different ways. One of the things to, that we have to recognize here is that we are on the cusp of being in a situation where um, the governor could very well get recalled. Let's say he gets 47% of the vote, right? So 47% of the population or 49% of the population vote to say, hey, we want to keep we want, to, we want to keep this guy in office, but of course, that's not a majority. So with that, uh, he, he would be recalled. And then someone could replace him with 19%. I mean, Larry Elder, who's the leading Republican candidate, is now polling at 19% in the polls. So there's an enormous gap between the support on that election day for the governor and his potential replacement. Um, and this, of course, has happened to, um, uh, uh, you know, to, to a colleague of ours, Josh Newman, who voted uh, for the gas tax uh, because he believed that it was an important thing to do to help the state's infrastructure. And he was recalled for it. Uh, and the interesting thing is the person who replaced him got you know, 36 percent of the vote and he got 46 you percent know, of the vote you know, voted against the recall. So uh, it, it's a it's a it's a you know, Erwin Chemerinsky has actually declared this whole system unconstitutional. I mean, it was a bold argument. I, I you know I'd be interested to see how it plays out in court. But his whole his central point is that there's something fundamentally undemocratic here. So there, from my perspective, we, we ought to do one of two things. We ought to either change the rules, at least for the gubernatorial. We've got a lieutenant governor um, who is there to replace the governor if the governor is incapacitated or passes away or whatever. Uh, so there's one proposal out there. George Skelton has written about this in the LA Times to say you can vote yes or no on recalling the governor. If the recall is successful, the job passes to the lieutenant governor. That's one proposal. The proposal I have, the, the SC, it's a Senate constitutional amendment uh, that, that I have on the table is to say, okay, let's let, uh, if, 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 if a recall reaches the requisite number of signatures, Let's let the governor uh, run in, in the recall election um, against whoever wants to jump in. So basically, instead of having two separate questions, you have one question. A recall has been, has been, uh, has been called. You know, please either vote for the governor or vote for an alternative. And if one of the alternatives gets more votes than the governor, fine, put that alternative in power. By the way, Arnold Schwarzenegger would have won against uh, Gray Davis, right? More people voted for Arnold Schwarzenegger than voted against the recall in the 2003 recall. So fair enough, let him let him take the office. Um, you know, a number of states around the country do it the way that I've proposed, and I think it would lead to a more democratic outcome, which is to say that you know that, that at the very least, on the day that we're considering this recall, we ought to um, to to uh, you know, if the, if we're going to replace the governor with somebody, that person ought to have more votes than the governor got on that day. 
Great. Uh, unless Senator Stern, you have anything to add, I'll, I can move on to the next question. Ben's pretty good at this stuff. <laughs> he is. Although I will say the Dean, you know, we're counting on, on our Dean here to, uh, to bring it home for us. I'm, I, hope <laughs> I hope it wasn't just an editorial. Chemerinsky may actually have to save the entire, uh, the Bear Republic here. So um, no pressure, Dean, if you're out there somewhere. Great, so next question uh, is from uh, Misha Zuckerman. Question is, any prospects for legislative fixes for Oceano Dunes? And thank you, Senator Allen, for your leadership on it. Yeah, um, so just for folks to know, Oceano Dunes is a, um, it, it's basically a site, it's a beautiful site uh, a city, within the state. It's interesting, the state park system, for the most part, is a place that focuses on conservation and recreation and wilderness, uh, and to some extent, historical preservation. But within the state park system, there is this, um, there's what are called state vehicular recreation areas, SVRAs, which are places for people to uh, go on all-terrain vehicles and drive around as a form of recreation. And of course, they're very damaging to um, the local environment. Um, and there's a lot of people who feel as though this is a, a pretty fundamental philosophical problem for the park system to have their pro conservation mission and yet this this vehicular recreation mission at the same time. And so there are a lot of folks who want to shut you know, basically there's a there's a site that they're literally sand dunes that not too far from the water um, when the when the cars when these when these ATVs go on the dunes they end up spitting up a lot of sand. They actually create a lot of particulate pollution that impacts the local neighborhoods that live, you know, the folks who live nearby. And so there's a real push to try to, 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 to either phase out, shut down, or, or significantly scale back um, the, the ATV use uh, on the Oceana Dunes. Um, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a complicated issue within the Newsom administration. There's a bit of a philosophical difference between the Coastal Commission that really wants to shut this down um, ultimately, because they just think that this is impacting. Um, it's, it's a pollution issue. It's an access question for people who aren't involved with ATVs. And of course, the Parks Department that feels this commitment to the ATV SVRA program, just this, this outdoor you know, recreation vehicle program. And, um, you know, I mean, from my perspective, uh, you know, it's it's a it, you know we we basically we sent a letter to the Coastal Commission. We're we're trying to you know we're I'm certainly pushing them on this issue. Um, uh, you know, I, I I think that there's there there are a lot of sites for people to engage in in all terrain vehicle recreation. I just think that the dunes is not the right place. There are too many environmental implications. There's too much pollution that it kicks up to nearby residential areas, and uh, I'm just hoping that 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 you know as the coastal commission is sort of taking our side. Um, and, and as members of the public become more aware of this and start to bring this issue up, uh, more and more, more and more pressure will be brought to bear on the administration to, to, uh, to, to at least significantly scale back the ATV uh, use on, on that site. But, you know, actually it's under your jurisdiction, Henry, your, your committee. I read a bill on this, but um, you know a lot about this too. But just to show you how deep it gets, um, you know, that one, that one issue that was brought up, you know, um, could take up this entire zoom meeting so um yeah we're, we're not we're not big on like uh driving your atvs over uh and not environmentally sensitive habitat areas you can i think i think we have to sort of reveal ourselves ben and i on that front we love we love our coast too much but, but i will say i mean what what's tricky about this is that it actually becomes a a, a really tricky um issue of of culture and class i mean we've got a lot of people a lot of you know a lot of working class folks who who and a lot of folks from all different backgrounds but but certainly um one of the sensitivity points here i think for both the administration and quite frankly for people like henry and me is that the types of folks who want to phase back this activity are are labeled you know coastal elites and that we're basically trying to take away this wholesome recreational activity for families with people who come from working class backgrounds from the Central Valley to go right around on the dunes. And so there's so that, that's another layer to this that's also uh, you know, complicated. I mean, I, I, you know, I, I, once again, I, I, you know, I've gotten too deep into this to feel good about allowing this activity to continue as it, as it, has, been, as it, as it has been carried out. But there is a, there's a tricky set of 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 culture issues here at play too 
And so to some extent, some of the national, um, the, the national conversation over politics is infusing its way into this debate. All right, so the next question may be for Senator Stern. This comes from John Burke, who is a constituent of Senator Stern's uh, Berkeley Law Class of 1989 and the 1996 Democratic nominee for the 19th State Senate District, which back then included parts of Senator Stern's current district. Question is, how might the legislature protect Californians' rights to seek redress in court against businesses and companies that deliberately or recklessly expose people and communities to COVID-19? Well, I'll say right at the gates that uh, my constituent also happens to be a, a, a very important public health warrior in this country, um, elevating his own personal experience. I, I, I read, I don't know how many months back it was, but um, uh, dealing with like, basically unmasked people putting him and his family at risk at a local department store. It happened in the San Fernando Valley. We watched these issues pretty closely. And John had John actually got all the way up to the CEO of Lowe's and basically they weren't enforcing any mask requirements and then putting not just him at risk, but his whole family at risk and, and trying to take to the courts to pursue that through, um, through, through tort law or through some other form of common law. That, that's, that's the current sort of MO of the system. Same goes for, say, you know, negligence or gross negligence occurring in our nursing homes. I've been dealing a lot with the for-profit nursing home industry, which is another sort of element. So whether you're in a department store or you have family and loved ones in congregate care of some sort, um, if there are bad operators, for-profit operators out there otherwise, um, what can we do? Frankly, we got very close to actually having uh, immunity or some form of some truncated liability for a whole bunch of private operators out there when Mitch McConnell was leveraging this as part of the COVID relief package. And the governor, luckily, and a bunch of other governors and legislators held strong and didn't say, you know, immunize all nursing homes from any kind of tort liability or all private businesses or all, you know, there, there were a number of, of sectors. I think it plays out right now in the courts, but there are sort of narrow instances where I think the legislature is going to jump in. There was a the uh, the cases uh, the Jarman case I think last year was a, a case where the California Supreme Court, for instance, I think misinterpreted a, a, a 1995 statute that said it you limit all penalties to, to nursing homes um, to five hundred dollars max, not per infraction per day, but total. So now when you have family members who say died in a nursing home, unless you can make a wrongful death claim, you have no other, you have no other recourse other than $500. Now we've partnered up, uh, the assembly majority leader and I have partnered up on some legislation where we're gonna try to fix that German decision and not just make it a one-time 500, but it can be per violation per day and hopefully we'll have some accountability. But I don't see us doing like a big across the board um, you know, sort of liability alteration. I think in those kind of narrow instances where the injustice is so egregious and the current recourse is so limited, that's probably where you see, I sit on Senate Judiciary, so that's probably where you see those sort of judiciary bills come through and, and, and look at the, the, you know, the, the changes that are needed um, in statute. But um, I think a lot of it's going to be on, you know, end up in Judge Yang's hands and all the other hardworking Superior Court judges out there and appellate judges to have to mine through some of this. And, and I, I think that that litigation cycle hasn't even fully culminated yet. So, um, but if things get screwed up in that litigation cycle, you're, you can be sure folks are gonna be coming back to the legislature to try to fix it. The problem is the timing doesn't work. And if, it's, if, if that justice is deferred, it's frankly gonna be denied to many people. And I. I um, anyway, I applaud him for his vigilance out there, but uh, it's it's tough country. Great. I think that's all the time we have uh, for the q and A. I want to give a huge thanks to Senator Allen, to Senator Stern, and to Anna Leary for the really enlightening discussion. And thanks also to Judge Yang for taking the lead in organizing this event in the first place. Thank you to the alumni office, including Mary Matherin and Aaron Deneen, for making this event possible. We have a number of upcoming events that I want you all to be aware of. There is a link 
in the chat to those events, but it includes on September 9th, we're gonna have a conversation uh, between Professor Amanda Tyler and the Honorable Marsha Berzon of the Ninth Circuit on the subject of exploring the legacy of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Watch your emails for an RSVP link for that. And of course, we have the uh, virtual alumni reunion that's happening September 23rd through 25th. And with that, I want to thank you all again. Thank you all in the audience for attending. And with that, take care. Have a good night.